episode that I'm doing just for myself. I decided this month that I was only going to talk about bands that I personally knew their music really well, that I was really familiar with. And part of that was just to make it easier on me, and then part of that was because at some point I do have to get around to talking about my actual tastes and what influences me to make a channel like this. Really, when you do any kind of retrospective channel like this, what you're doing is selectively choosing what to preserve. And you're saying, in some sense, what, for whatever reason you find this music notable, this is what deserves to be remembered, or this is what I think that people should associate with this period. So apparently, according to the two or three bands that I've done so far on this theme, in order to be considered a significant band in my estimation, it needs to be a post-hardcore band from America who was short-lived, did not last for very long. They're considered influential by bands that were more successful than them later on. And in most cases, these bands are very under the radar. They are not the primary sounds or musicians that you would associate with this period. Or that most people would, anyway. But for me, when I'm talking about my personal favorite music of the decade, it is along the lines of these bands that I've been talking about. And that also goes for this week's band as well, Drive Like Jehu. Drive Like Jehu were a post-hardcore band from San Diego, California. The band's lineup consists of John Reese on guitar, Rick Froberg on vocals and guitar, Mike Kennedy on bass, and Mark Trombino on the drums. John Reese and Rick Froberg had played together in the band Pitchfork prior to this. I'm sorry I haven't heard them. And at the time when he decided to form another band, Drive Like Jehu, John Reese had become the frontman of another band called Rocket from the Crypt. The name Drive Like Jehu is derived from an obscure Bible verse in the Old Testament. This is from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 9, verse 20. And the watchman told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, son of Nishmi, for he driveth furiously. They were very much not a religious band, other than the name. They released their first album, Drive Like Jehu, in 1991, on Cargo and Headhunter Records. If you're not familiar with post-hardcore, this was a sound that developed due to bands who wanted to continue to carry the spirit and the harshness and aggressiveness of hardcore punk into a more futuristic context. Drive Like Jehu were a almost punishingly experimental band, which incorporated a lot of noise and a lot of screaming, a lot of fast tempos. <laughs> But it was a, a bit removed from the stereotypical anger and, and political motivations of hardcore punk. Their sound became very expansive on certain songs. They almost incorporate more progressive rock or post-rock influences into certain songs which stretch beyond the 8 and 9 minute mark. <laughs> But the nice thing about this album is that it does also contain their most normal-ish and concise punk rock songs. They would never sound this accessible again. In 1994, they released their second album, Yank Crime, on Interscope Records. So in the early 90s, John Reese's other band, Rocket from the Crypt, was signed by Interscope, and apparently he was able to swing a deal with the major label that he would agree to sign with Interscope Records as long as they also signed Drive Like Jehu. So he's playing in two different bands at this time. The major label wants one of them. As you know, in the early 90s, major label executives were taking risks that they never would have taken in the previous decade. This is where really long-running and really harsh and uncommercial and experimental groups like Butthole Surfers and Meat Puppets were being signed by major record labels. Drive Like Jehu got swept along in that as well, thanks to one of their members having a very acute business sense. Because I guarantee you, if any major label record executive had bothered to listen to this album before releasing it, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have heard anything that they thought would be commercially successful. And it's not to say this isn't a good album, it's that this album really holds nothing back. It builds on the experimental tendencies of the first album, but if anything, takes them further into more noisy, and at times borderline unlistenable territory. They don't ease you into it. The first song, Here Come the Rome Plows, is over five and a half minutes of just driving, pounding, aggressive, harsh noise and screaming. <laughs> Here 
Meanwhile, the songs Do Compute, Luau, Super Unison, and the closing track Sinews stretch the running times of their songs like never before. gets to the point where they start to become reminiscent of like a krautrock band like Can or something. Like a post-hardcore version of Can, if you can imagine that. The structures are very repetitive. The atmospherics of the guitars and the playing are also very spacey. You use a lot of feedback on harmonics and just pure static fuzz white noise. Seemingly just for the sake of the noise itself. I'm not positive this record actually has any emotional point to make. While the sound is about as harsh and aggressive as it gets, it's not very clear what they're expressing exactly. One flaw of the album is that a lot of the songs are a bit too similar to each other. They're almost like two different variations on the same thing. Almost as if this was meant as a concept album of some kind. When you get right down to it, in a vacuum, each song separated one from the other is excellent on its own terms and really expands the boundaries of what underground rock music can be. My favorite song on here is New Math, thanks to Mark Trombino's straight up insane drum fills. And to their credit, pretty much every song on here has at least one weird, unique hook that finds a way to lodge itself into your head, despite the outrageously challenging presentation. After Yank Crime, which was a commercial flop to no one's surprise, the band broke up in 1995. Maurice had his other band Rock From The Crypt, so he just kept on playing and performing with them. Rick Froberg played in a band called Thingy, and then later on he moved to New York to pursue a career as a visual artist and illustrator. Mike Kennedy left music altogether and became a chemist. And out of all the members of the band, the one who probably had the most contact with mainstream commercial success was the drummer Mark Trombino, who became a producer for popular bands such as Blink-182, Jimmy Eat World, and All Time Low. Later on, John Reese and Rick Froberg played together in the band Hot Snakes, who released a bunch of albums in the 2000s. John Reese also performed in a band called The Night Marchers. Rick Froberg also performed in a band called Obits. Drive Like Jehu also reunited in 2014. Apparently what actually got them to reunite was the opportunity to play with a San Diego era organist named Dr. Carol Williams. They played a number of other shows and festivals in 2015 and 2016 before re-disbanding. And they have been cited by bands as diverse and significant as At The Drive-In, Modest Mouse, and Deftones as a formative influence. I think the band's biggest strength is that to this day, their artistic legacy is somewhat inscrutable. Like, I'm sorry, I just can't make sense of what this band's music was supposed to mean. And that's a good thing. It's just art for the sake of art, as far as I could tell. You know, that gives it more malleability and more applicability. And really, that was what the whole band was about, is about opening up these boundaries and doing new things and just taking music to places that it hadn't been before. And for that, to this day, Drive Like Jehu remain one of my favorite bands of the 90s. Until next time, this was Rad 90s Music. I'm Jacob, and I'll see you sometime in the future.